Thanks for joining us today here at Emmanuel. We are one church in multiple locations. We believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that we hope is both inspiring and relevant to your life. If this service blesses you and you want to give back financially, you can do so at eclife.org. Click on Give and choose Online Viewer as your campus. Thank you again for joining us. Get ready for an incredible life-changing message. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Church. We are so glad that you're here. If you would stand with us as we worship together this morning. Sweetest of loves, where my heart. 
Good morning. You may have a seat for just a couple of seconds. My name is Matt Randall. I'm your campus pastor here at the Greenwood campus, and we just want to say welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this weekend at Emmanuel. Uh, I've got an exciting thing to tell you about. Our Franklin campus pastor, Greg Coble, is in the house to finish out the series at the movies. Yeah. <laughs> We're excited. Uh, the boss man's coming back next week. He's been on a three-week study break, and we're excited to have him back. He's going to kick off a brand new series. Uh, Greg will tell you about that towards the end of today. So we're pumped. Uh, if you are a guest with us here today, maybe it's your first time with us. Uh, hopefully you felt welcome so far. But we just want to let you know a couple of things. Uh, first up, we've got a couple more songs when I'm finished, and we'll be receiving our offering uh, once I'm done as well. Uh, for those of That offering is for those that call Emmanuel home. But we would love for you to do something for us uh, as your first time here. There's a connection card. It looks like this. It's in the seat back right in front of you. Uh, we'd love to connect with you uh, as you've joined us this weekend. And so if you'll fill that, uh, that card out for us, just some basic information on the front. You can drop that at our information desk, which is just out and to the right on your way home. We'll put a free gift in your hands just to say thank you for joining us. And we'll also put some information about a manual in your hands as well and answer any questions that you might have about us as a church. Also, I want everybody to know we're going to do something a little different today in the way that we do communion. We're going to celebrate communion towards the end of our service, and it's going to be a little different than what we've done before. Uh, we're going to be passing buckets with prepackaged uh, communion packs for all of us this morning. So the intent of that is so that we can all stay seated and enjoy a moment uh, with Jesus uh, in that moment. And so we also want all of you that may have a gluten sensitivity to know, just like we have in the past, we do have uh, options for you as well. We wanted to make sure we provided those. They are at the back of the auditorium. And once I'm finished up here, we'll have a couple more songs. So during that time, feel free, go back. Uh, you can grab that during that time. Uh, and then you can use the seat or the cup holder in the seat right in front of you uh, to hold that if you have a gluten sensitivity until we are ready to uh, participate in communion later. A little bit different, but we just wanted to make sure everybody knew what was going on. Uh, and we're excited about that coming up at the end of the service. Also want you to know uh, about baptism. We have a baptism service coming up at the end of this month. We like to do those big and bold around here to celebrate those that have made decisions to take the next step in their relationship with Jesus. So if that is you, we want to encourage you to register now, get up ahead of time and do that. Uh, we'll be registering, I believe, through the 19th of this month. And so uh, you can find all that information at myeclife.org. Now, for you whippersnappers with smartphones, let me tell you, we have a brand new option to unveil for you in registering for baptism and a bunch of other stuff that we're going to have going on. But in particular for baptism, if you take your cell phone out and you text, text the word baptism to 65248, that's going to be our home number here for uh, Emmanuel. If you text baptism, it jumpstarts your registration process. And that won't be the last time that you'll hear us talk about our texting options to allow things to be a little easier for us that are registering for events and stuff around here. Uh, so we're excited about Baptism Weekend coming up at the end of the month. We'll hope that you get uh, registered for that soon. Before we receive our offering, uh, we want to make sure that we show you, or uh, at least share with you, a little bit of the things that we're celebrating around here. Uh, I'm excited to celebrate some camp news from our middle school and high schoolers. Give me some noise, middle school, high school students. There you go. We had more students this year, 170 from middle school and high school at our camp. That's more students than we've had in the last seven years, and we want to celebrate that this morning. You've heard us talk about camp before. But let me even tell you that the most exciting part. You see, they have a, an experience I would be a little jealous of, but during that time at camp, 16 students for the first time made decisions to trust Jesus, uh, and we want to celebrate that for sure. And so if you, if you run into somebody who's been a counselor or a staff member that's helped out at camp, we just uh, want to love on them a little bit because that's exciting. And you see, for those of you that came prepared to give today, we just want to say thank you and to let you know that it's not just environments like this that you help support, but it's our environments at camp uh, and in our community and across our world that you're able to support the incredible God, uh, work that God is doing through Emmanuel. Would you join me in a spirit of prayer? Lord, we come to you today grateful, grateful that we can come to uh, this place where we can lift our voices to you in worship and in song, but also that we can lift our hearts. And so, Lord, as Greg brings the message you've laid on his heart today, I just ask that you open our hearts and our ears to what it is you would have us to hear and change in our lives by what Greg brings. Lord, we're grateful for you, and in this presence, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You unravel me 
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer
Hello, welcome to Emmanuel. My name is Greg Coble. I am the Franklin Campus Pastor, but I'm glad to be here with you today to uh, close out the series called At the Movies. If you guys enjoyed this series, has this been fun for you to talk about these old movies? What we've been doing with these old movies is we've been trying to pull the godly principles out of the storylines, and so we've looked at some, some really classic movies like Toy Story. <laughs> I don't know what Matt's, I don't know what he was thinking with that one. But anyway, uh, did you enjoy Bill's talk last week, Star, the Star Wars talk? I can't believe that that movie is 40 years old. I mean, that just blows my mind to think about that that movie is 40 years old because the technology that they used in that movie was incredible. I started to think after Bill said it was 40 years old, how technology has changed even in our lifetime. Uh, I brought some, some props with me this morning to show you. I don't have a cool lightsaber like Bill had, but uh, 40 years ago, for example, if we wanted to make a phone call, if we wanted to communicate with our friends and family, this is what we used. This is a rotary dial phone, kids. <laughs> what you had to do is you had to stick your finger in here and you actually had to turn the dial. And you had to do that, I don't know, seven times, is that right? Heaven forbid that your friend have an eight or a nine in their phone number and your fingers slip out of the dial while you were dialing and you had to start all over. <laughs> what do we do now when we want to communicate with our friends and family? We use our phones, our smartphones, right? We pull them out. We probably don't even call. We just text. We even get lazy sometimes and do a group text and hope we can get eight or ten people at a time. That's how technology has changed in the last 40 years. Here's another example. This is an encyclopedia. <laughs> now, we used to have volumes of these things, like 20, 30 volume sets of encyclopedias, because if we wanted to do a research paper, maybe on geography or history or politics, uh, whatever, we had to go to these encyclopedias and thumb through page after page after page, finding the information we need. Now, if we want information, what do we do? We just go to our smartphones, right? Kat and I just took a two-week road trip out west with some friends, and uh, there were lots of things that we wanted to, uh, to know while we were traveling. So we just pick up our smartphone, smartphone and say, Siri, what's the capital of South Dakota? Siri, what's the elevation of the Bighorn Mountain? I mean, we had all kinds of information right there at our fingertips. Technology is incredible. Even inside the church, the way technology has changed the last 40 years, it, it allows us to do the kinds of things we do here at Emmanuel. Like 40 years ago, we could have not have been one church in many locations. This multi-site strategy that we're using to spread the gospel, the, the technology wasn't available to churches. Like we could not have done that 40 years ago. And who knows how technology is, will change in the next, I don't know, five, 10 years. Five years from now, if Danny takes a study break in the summer, you might have a Greg Coble hologram standing up here doing the sermon, you know? It'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Maybe we could even make him a little younger and a little thinner. That'd be kind of cool. You see, technology is always changing. We're getting ready to do this live stream thing 
where people all over the world can tune in and watch an Emmanuel service live. Anybody, anybody, anywhere in the world can tune in. Like if my mom wants to watch an Emmanuel service when I preach in the future, she can tune in and watch me live from her family room in her bathrobe in her lazy boy. That's going to be really cool. Except that my mom is a little technologically challenged, so I'm not sure she'll actually be able to tune in. About six years ago, my oldest son Baxter joined the Air Force. And we wanted to help my folks uh, communicate with him really easily. So we actually bought them an iPad. And we set them up with an account with an app called Voxer. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Voxer app, but it's a virtual walkie-talkie. Like you leave a voicemail and then it sends an immediate notification. And they can, leave a, they can respond with a voicemail. It's, and it goes back and forth. It's really simple to use. And after a couple of weeks, Baxter reached out to uh, his grandma, his nana, and, and asked her why she hadn't been returning his Voxer calls. She Skyped, uh, he Skyped with her on her home computer just to ask her that question. And she said, Baxter, I think I have the wrong number. Every time I call you, some lady answers. And he said, well, Nana, that's not the really, really the way it works. Why don't you go get your iPad and kind of show me what you're doing? So she brings it back in front of the camera. She opens up the Voxer app. And instead of pressing the microphone button on the, on the screen, she actually presses the home button. And she says, Baxter, can you hear me? To which Siri responds, I do not understand, Baxter, can you hear me? My mom says, see, there's that lady. <laughs> True story. Now, the good news is, my mom and Siri are now friends on Facebook. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but Baxter just cracks up. He can't wait to get off the phone with Nana and Skype call with me just to tell me what she's done. It's hilarious. So we laugh about it a little bit. And I said, now, Baxter, you shouldn't laugh at your Nana. You shouldn't laugh at your Nana because technology changes so much. Like in her lifetime, the things we're doing now, people couldn't have even dreamt of 50 years ago. And when, when you are your Nana's age, there are things that you would not even dream of that you'll be able to do. You might even have a time machine. But, but to use that time machine, you'll probably have to call your 12-year-old grandson and have him come over and program it for you. I said, now the good news is you'll be able to have him program it to this very day, and you can go back and apologize to your Nana for laughing at her. <laughs> That's a true story. That really happened. Wouldn't it be cool to have a time machine? Have you ever thought, man, if you had a time machine, it would just really be really cool. It's kind of what uh, our, our character and our story today, uh, Back to the Future, Marty McFly was able to use a time machine. Uh, Back to the Future is set in 1985. Marty McFly is a 17-year-old kid. His parents are George and Lorraine. George is a slightly nerdy guy that gets bullied by his boss. Lorraine is, uh, is a little overweight, and she's potentially alcoholic. They don't really develop the character enough for us to know at the beginning. Marty has a couple of escapes, a few escapes from his reality. He loves his music. He plays with a hard rock band. He loves his girlfriend, Jennifer, and he loves his friendship with a uh, kooky, self-funded scientist guy named Dr. Emmett Brown. One day, Doc Brown shows Marty this time machine that he's invented. And the time machine is actually housed in a DeLorean DMC-12. I've got a clip I want to show you this morning. Uh, the, the clip of where Doc Brown shows Marty the time machine for the first time and explains to him how it works. Take a look at this clip. The scene immediately after that one uh, is where Marty, in a panic, jumps into the DeLorean and he is accidentally transported back to 1955. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to go back in time? I, I venture to say if you're a married man and you're like me, you probably have. Like there are things that, that I think sound really funny in my head. But as soon as they pass my lips and I see the look on my wife's face, I just want to go back a few minutes and take it back. So if you're a married guy, you probably have thought about going back in time. You know, if, if I could go back in time, there were things, there are things that I would change, not just what I have said to my wife, uh, but I, I would change some of the things of my, about my future career, my education, if I could go back in time, I would change the way I handle my money. If I could go back in time, I would change the way I parented. 
If I could go back in time, I would change lots of things. If you could go back in time, what would you change? If you could go back in time, what would you change? What would you do differently? You see, most of the things that I would change are the things that I regret. Like, I regret not being a better husband or a better father or a better son. I regret not being a better friend and building better relationships with people. Do you have any regrets? You know, nobody, nobody wants to live without, nobody wants to live with regrets. That's your first feeling today. Nobody wants to live with regrets. I recently read a study that said the highest rated negative emotion is regret. Over and over again, when they ask people to rate their emotions, regret is ranked as the highest negative emotion. The study said that if you live with regret long enough, it actually can damage us both Uh, both our minds and our bodies can be damaged by long-term regret. Nobody wants to live with regret. Listen to how the actor and filmmaker Ron Howard described his regrets. He said, the regrets I have are strong enough that I wouldn't want to share them with anybody. I think that you can't live without suffering some regret. You know, in our movie, Marty McFly doesn't live in his regrets. He goes out and gets some advice. And and I looked for some advice on the internet that I wanted to share with you guys because, listen, there's bad advice all around us when it comes to living without regret. And I want to share some things with you this morning. The first bit of advice that I found was that uh, if you're going to live a life without regret, you got to follow your own path. Follow your own path. It said only you know what's best for you, so go for it. The second thing I found out there that's floating around, maybe you've heard it before, maybe you've even tried it. Try to find happiness. This one actually said, try to find happiness with as many different people as you can. Now, what I hope it meant was try to find peace with as many people as you can, but I'm afraid what it meant was bounce from relationship to relationship until you find the one that makes you happy. Here's another one. It said, gain independence. Nobody has the right to hold you back. Nobody can put baby in a corner. You know what I'm saying? Now, see, I have a little experience with this one. My wife is actually a business owner. And at work, she manages several people and and some teams. And she's pretty big stuff at work. But sometimes at home, I have to put my foot down and I have to remind her, you are not the boss of me. It's one of those things that sounds funny in my head, but as soon as it comes out, I know I'm in trouble every time. And then the last thing I found, the last piece of advice that's floating around out there is do what you love to do as much as you can, as often as you can, above all else, do what you love to do. Now listen, this may not be all bad advice. There may actually be some truth in here somewhere, some value in here when they're done properly. But when I look at at these four things in particular, and and I think about my past and the choices that I've made and the lenses that I've used to make those choices, whenever I made a choice through one of these lenses, it left me with some regrets. It left me with some things that I wish that I could have changed. Times when I should have listened to somebody else. Times when if I knew now what I... If I knew then what I know now, I would have done them differently. But when Marty goes to 1955, he doesn't sit around and think about what he could have done or what he should have done differently. He recognizes that the past is the past. Like, what happened, happened. And, and now he has, to, he has to just move on. He can't change it. He has to actually start thinking about how he's going to get back to the future. Now, we have to do the same thing. When, when it comes to what's in the past, we have to get beyond it. We can't spend all of our time thinking about regrets and, and what we would do differently and what we would change. It's not healthy for us. Instead, we've got to get busy about protecting our future. You see, we can't change the past, but you can safeguard your life from future regrets. You can't change the past, but you can safeguard your life from future regrets. Now, we don't have Doc Brown to help us on that journey, but we have this guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul, and we can see some of the advice that that he gave to some people at the church in Ephesus. 
You see, Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus and he said, if you want to safeguard your life from future regret, you've got to do some things. And the first thing he told them is you have to be careful how you live. If you want to safeguard your life from future regret, you have to be careful how you live. You see, the church in Ephesus, uh, it was a culture a lot like ours is today, maybe even worse. The Ephesians, uh, they were trying to live out godly principles, but the people all around them were making foolish choices. The people all around them were living for their own pleasures. There were uh, blurred lines between right and wrong when it came to morality and truth. There were some things that society had once deemed so far out of bounds that nobody would do them that were now being celebrated, and some of those things were even turned into acts of religious worship. See, Ephesus was a place where you could make lots of bad choices of things that you would later regret. I've got a feeling that if they sold t-shirts in Ephesus, they probably would have said, what happens in Ephesus stays in Ephesus. That's how bad it was. But when Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says this in verse 15, he says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. He says, if you want to live a life without regret, you've got to be wise. In some translations, it says, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. Now, I think I have a perfect illustration for this point, but I'm going to warn you, some of you will think it's a little gross, maybe a little disgusting, but if you stick with me, I think you'll see my point. My son Baxter, he's still in the Air Force, and he's on six-month deployment right now. So we've been dog-setting for his Australian shepherd. Her name is Mia. She is a brilliant dog, too smart for her own good, I'm telling you. But every day, multiple times a day, she goes to the door to let us know that she needs to go outside because she needs to go out in the yard and do what dogs do in the yard. You know what I'm saying? She goes out in the yard and she leaves little piles of calling cards all over the yard. So when I go out in the yard, I have to be careful where I walk. I have to be careful where I step because I know there are dangers out there in the grass. I know if I'm not careful, there's going to be a price to pay, right? Sometimes when I go to the garage, I actually go the long way, down the driveway and around instead of cutting straight through the grass because I know there are dangers in the grass. You guys would probably say, Greg, it'd be foolish of you to think that Mia would go outside and care enough about you that she would go and do her business someplace else, maybe in the neighbor's yard. That'd be great, wouldn't it? (laughs) Then I wouldn't have to worry. It'd be foolish of me to go out in the yard and pretend that nothing was there and just, just tromp around in the yard and then drag it all back in the house with me. That would be nasty. But no, I, I try to be wise. I try to watch where I step. And that's the same advice that Paul was giving to the Ephesians. Now, I don't necessarily think Paul was thinking about dog poo when he wrote that verse, but but he said, listen, I'm going to give you a warning. There are dangers all around you. You need to be careful how you live. You need to watch where you step. When Marty went back to 1955, Doc Brown gave him a warning. Doc Brown said, Marty, you need to be careful where you go. You need to be careful who you talk to. Because even the slightest interruption in the space-time continuum could jeopardize the future. Now, what Doc didn't know was that Marty had already bumped into a couple of teenagers in town. He had bumped into his future parents. He had actually interrupted their chance meeting it was, it was that chance meeting that later made them fall in love. So, so Marty had already jeopardized his own future because if his parents don't meet, they don't fall in love. If they don't fall in love, Marty's never born. If Marty's never born, he's actually going to cease to exist right there in 1955. So Marty puts together a plan. Marty thinks about the history of his parents. He's been told over and over again how they met and fell in love. So Marty puts together a four-step plan. Step number one, get the parents to meet. Step number two, make sure they get to the enchantment under the sea dance. Step number three, make sure that they're slow dancing together to the song Earth Angel because that's where they, step number four, kiss and fall in love. 
So Marty puts his plan in place. Marty works this plan even when it seems that everything is working against him. Even when it looks like all odds are stacked up against him, Marty stays focused on his plan because Marty knows that his plan, if executed properly, will fix his future. You know, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, the second piece of advice he gave them was very similar to that. Paul said, you have to be intentional with your time. Listen, if you're going to safeguard your life from future regret, you've got to be intentional with your time. You've got to have a plan. This is the way Paul said it in verse 16. He said, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Maximize, get the most out of every single opportunity. The only way you're going to do that is to have a plan, to be intentional. Listen, nobody ever plans to fail. But Benjamin Franklin thought it was so important to plan. He said this. He said, if you fail to plan, you're just planning to fail. None of us ever plan to fail. None of us ever plan to have regrets in our life. But the reason that so many of us do is because we didn't plan not to. You know, we just go along with life and we ignore the dangers and the red flags because everybody else is around us. They're ignoring them too. And then before you know it, we're we're right in the middle of a crisis, like we're right in the middle of a relational or an emotional or a financial crisis because we haven't put together a plan. We haven't been intentional with our time. Listen, I've never heard of anybody standing in front of their friends and family on their wedding day and saying, I can't wait to be married. I am going to blow this thing up. I'm going to ruin my life. I'm going to ruin her life. You think you've seen a bad marriage? You ain't seen nothing yet. Nobody does that. Nobody has ever uh, applied for their first student loan for school and and thought that one day it was going to leave them working miserable jobs that they hate just to make enough money to pay back the loan. Nobody's ever booked uh, at all-inclusive resort vacation with their credit card, thinking that it was also going to include money fights and money problems down the road because their spouse thought that they were spending irresponsibly. Nobody plans to fail. But listen, we don't have to look too far around us to see marriages falling apart all around us, to see people in financial ruin all around us. You know, nobody ever takes their first drink or their first hit thinking, this is going to lead me down the road to addiction. This is going to ruin my life. This is going to leave me feeling untrustworthy. It's going, to, it's going to leave me desperate and broken. Nobody ever does that. But you don't have to look too far. Some of you even here today may have had to deal with that in your life. And it's not because we plan to fail. It's because we didn't plan not to. This is an area of your life that even the smallest investments in time can have a big, big payoff. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. If you want to live without regret in your life, in your marriage, man, here's what I would tell you. 50% of the the, uh, marriages today end in divorce. There's a study out there that says men who pray with their wives every day out loud, have a 1 in 10,000 chance of getting divorced. You want to safeguard your marriage from regret? Be intentional with your time. Two or three minutes a day, man, grab your wives as godly a way as possible. Hold her hand, hold her in your arms, and pray over her, pray with her, pray for her. Let her hear you thank God for your relationship. Let her hear you ask God to make you the kind of godly man she deserves. Ask God to make you both the kind of godly examples to the people you'll come in contact with during that day, the kind of examples that will attract people to him. Man, there is nothing your wife wants to hear more than than your heart toward her and your heart toward God. You want to safeguard your life your married life from future regret. Be intentional with your time. Two to three minutes a day, man. Pray with your wives. 
That study, that, that was done by a man named David McLaughlin. It's in a study called The Role of the Man in the Family. Guys, two to three minutes a day can save your lives and keep you from living without regret. Second example is this. Do you want to live without a regret in your financial life? Spend five to ten minutes a month making a budget. Every month before the month begins, spend your paper or spend your money on paper on purpose. Write down how much money you have coming in. Write down where it needs to go. I know some of you think uh, the budget word, the B word, is, is like a four-letter word in your home. Like, you don't want to hear it. You think it's restrictive. You think it feels like punishment. And I know that because that's the way I felt. About 10 years ago, Kat said, we're going to start living on a budget. And I felt punished. For about 90 days, I felt punished. For 90 days, we, we wrote down every dollar that we were going to make. We wrote down where every dollar was going to go. We had a plan. We knew where our money was going. And after 90 days, we felt like we got a raise. Because a budget is simply this, guys. It's a way to tell your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. If you want to live a life without regret in your finances, you have got to be intentional with your time. We've been doing that now for 10 years, and we are living without any consumer debt, completely debt-free. And you guys can do that too. You just have to be intentional with your time. You've got to have a plan. You see, Paul continued with the Ephesians in verse 16. He said this. He said, don't act thoughtlessly. I'm sorry, verse 17. Don't act thoughtlessly. And I'm glad that there's a comma after that thought. Like, I'm glad that's not the end of the sentence. If Paul had just said, don't act thoughtlessly, and he ended it there, we might actually think that we could find out what it means to not act thoughtlessly in, uh, in, in other areas of our life. So we, we might look around us. We might look at society or culture or the world to find out what it looks like not to act thoughtlessly. But thankfully, Paul continues his thought. He says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Because if we want to live a life without regret, if we want to safeguard our future, we have to understand God's will. We have to understand God's will for our life. Now, you might wonder, how do you understand God's will? It, it would be neat like if, if I could stand up here in front of you today and say, you know what, I all know that you came today because you want to understand God's will. So in just a few minutes... I'm just going to command you to understand, and when I do, just you'll have total clarity, one, two, three, understand. I don't think it worked for anybody, did it? You see, it just doesn't work that way. It'd be nice if we could just pray a prayer and say, oh God, send me complete and, and thorough understanding of your will. And then we open our eyes, and, and there it is. It's just completely clear. It's right in front of us. Or if, if during baptism, like we, we go under the water, we don't know what God's will is, we come out of the water, hallelujah, I can see God's will. It just doesn't work that way. See, if we're going to be intentional, or if we're going to know God's will, we have to be intentional about searching for God's will. We have to be in search of God's will. When, uh, when Doc Brown realized that he needed plutonium to operate the time machine in 1955, he realized he was not going to find plutonium. And so he had to start thinking about what he, could, what he could use as a power source to power the time machine. And then he learned about the lightning strike. There was going to be a lightning strike that would hit the clock tower. So Doc Brown decided that if he could just tap into and harness that power source, he could have that 1.21 gigawatts he needed to power the time machine and get Marty back home. You see, guys, if we're going to live a life without regret, if we're going to get the, the, the results that we desire, we've got to tap into the right power source. We can look at society, we can look at culture, we can look at the world around us and try to figure it out, but guys, the only proper power source for understanding God's will is God's word. We, we've talked about several things today, several of my regrets. Listen, do you want to know how to parent your children better? Do you want to know what God's will is for parenting your kids? Read God's word, it's in there. You want to know how to conduct yourself at work? You want to know what God's will is for you at work? It's in there. 
Wives, do you want to know how to love your husbands? And husbands, do you want to know how to love your wives? It's in there. You see, there's not a single area of our lives that God doesn't speak to in his word. And if we're going to find God's will for our lives, we have to connect to the right power source. We have to connect to God's word. Here's the way Paul wrote it in the uh, book of Romans, in his letter to the church at Rome. In Romans 12, 2, he said, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. He said, that's not the right power source. That's not going to give you the results, you, the results you desire. He says, but God transform you, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. He said, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Listen, if we're going to understand God's will for our lives, we have got to be intentional about searching for it. And the place to search for it is in God's word. It doesn't take long, guys. Five to ten minutes a day reading God's word will reveal to you what God's will is for your life. You got to create some margin somewhere. You have to be intentional. Maybe you you spend five or ten minutes in the morning while you're drinking coffee, or maybe it's five or ten minutes at your lunchtime, or maybe it's five or ten minutes before you go to bed, but you've got to create a plan for connecting with the right power source to understand God's will. Listen, eventually Marty gets back to 1985. And when he gets back to 1985, he realizes that all his hard work, all his determination while he was in 1955 has paid off in a big way. You see, when he gets back, he realizes his future's changed. His parents, his, his dad is no longer this nerdy guy. He's actually a successful author. His mom is no longer overweight and potentially alcoholic. She's fit and she's active. Marty's future is is better than he could have ever dreamed of before he left. And so my question to you today is, do you want a better future? Do you want a better future? Do you want a future that doesn't have regret? Then you have to do the three things that Paul advises us to do. Paul advises us to be careful how we live be intentional with our time, and to understand God's will. You see, there's one thing that I mentioned earlier, but I didn't really take the time to explain, and I I think I probably should. You see, when Paul wrote his letters, he wrote his letters to the church. So he was writing his letters to church people. And and those people, the church people, the, the people in Ephesus, the people in Rome, where those churches were, those were people who had trusted God. They trusted that God wanted what was best for them. Like they trusted God that way. And that's really kind of where it begins for us too. We have to trust that God has our best interest at heart. Like God wants what is best for us. And if, you've, if you haven't trusted God that way, you, you, you need to do that today because when you trust God that way, the Bible tells us that he's going to send his Holy Spirit into our lives. The Bible says that his Spirit will come in and fill our lives. His Spirit will invade us. Here's the way Paul kind of wraps up this part of his, of his letter to the Ephesians. He says, listen, don't don't make decisions that are going to leave you with regret, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled to the top, to the brim with the Holy Spirit. He says, listen, be filled so much with the Holy Spirit that you don't leave room for regret. You don't leave room for anxiety or doubt. You don't leave room for worry or for frustration. You don't leave room for anger or bitterness or selfishness. Be filled to the top with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's the Holy Spirit's job to guide us and to prompt us to live a life that's pleasing to God. And if you've never trusted God that way, if you've never trusted God and said, God, I I open my heart and my life to you, fill me, invade my life with your Holy Spirit, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that today because that's the only way to safeguard your life from future regret is to start with trust. So in just a couple of seconds, we're gonna 
We're going to bow our heads and we're going to close our eyes. And I'm just going to invite you to have a moment with God. I'm going to invite you to to ask God to come into your heart that way. I'm going to invite you to tell him that you trust him and that you want to begin a relationship with him. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you need to start a relationship with God in that way, if you need to start trusting God that way, I I just invite you to, to say this prayer with me. Just make these words your own. Just have a moment with you and God right there in the quietness of your heart. Just say this, God, I trust you. I want to start that kind of relationship with you today. God, I just ask you to to send your spirit into my heart and into my life right now. Make me a different person. God, I understand that only your spirit and my trust in you can safeguard my life from future regret. And I want that today. God, I invite you into my life. Thank you for making that possible through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Listen, the Bible says if you pray that kind of prayer, if you trust God that way, if you invite him into your life, that you've become a child of God. And today, to celebrate that with you, we would love to give you a free gift. At the end of the service, if you'll go to the tables in the back of the auditorium and tell the folks back there that you prayed that prayer, they will put one of these books in your hands. This book is uh, is a one-year New Testament. The New Testament is the part of the Bible that talks about the life of Jesus and the people who were here with him during his days of ministry. This book is broken down into readings of five or ten minutes a day. And if you'll read those daily readings, five to ten minutes a day, that small investment of time will begin to reveal to you what God's will is for your life. Can we celebrate what God is doing here today through Emmanuel? Now today we have an opportunity to have a time of communion together. Communion is something that that Jesus passed down to his disciples more than 2,000 years ago. You see, the last time they had a meal together, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he passed pieces of that bread around his disciples. He said, I want you to take this bread, I want you to eat it, and I want you to understand that this bread represents my broken body, my body that's about to be broken for you. And then he passed around a a cup with some wine and he said, I want you to drink this wine and I want you to understand that this wine represents my blood and my blood is just about to be spilled for you. And the reason my body is going to be broken, the reason my blood is going to be spilled is to be a once and for all sacrifice for your sin and for the sins of all eternity and all the people to come. And he said to his disciples, as often as you eat this bread, or drink this cup. I want you to do it in remembrance of me. So today, if you've put your trust in Christ, if you've invited him into your life, I just invite you as our host team comes and brings our packages of the of the the cracker and the and the juice, just to stay where you are. And as soon as you receive this package, I just invite you to bow your head, to close your eyes, and just have a moment with God. Have a moment with God remembering what it was that Jesus did for you on the cross when he gave his body, when he spilled his blood for sacrifice for your sins. Let's uh, let's pray as we prepare for communion. God, thank you for your love toward us. Thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place. God, this morning as we enter this time of communion, I just pray that you would clear our hearts and clear our minds just to have a moment with you where we're not thinking about anything else. We're just remembering like Jesus told us to. We're just remembering the broken body, the shed blood, the gift of salvation, God. Thank you so much for the way you love us. Prepare our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to Yeah.
I have enjoyed being with you guys today. I uh, tell everybody all the time, you know, when Greg Coble speaks, you may not learn anything, but you'll be entertained. So I hope at least you were entertained today, but I hope you went away. You'll go away today learning something too. Uh, Danny's going to be back next week, and uh, he's going to start a brand new series called Mixtape. We're going <laughs> to go back in time next week too and talk about mixtapes. Uh, something else we'll probably have to tell the kids about. So, But thank you for being here. Come back next week and bring a friend. Let's, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, it's been a, a wonderful time being here with you today and meeting with your people. God, I just pray that as we go, you would allow us to be what you want us to be. God, thank you for allowing us to partner with you to do your work right here. God, help us to be uh, the kind of people that attract others to you. Give us the courage, give us the strength, God, to step into living a life with no regret. Father, all we want is to glorify your son, Jesus, and we hope that's been done here today. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. Come back next week.